my name is Andres Cuervo, um, and the long-winded version of or title of my talk is JS in the Virtual and Augmented Reality Ecosystem. Um, and the reason I named it that is because I'm going to be talking about a lot of stuff uh, today. Um, but before I get into the before I get into it, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am. Uh, I am an artist, an engineer, um, a software developer. Uh, right now, I'm an AR engineer at a uh, marketing technology company called Movable Inc. Uh, and we are building a web AR platform. Um, I am not going to be talking about that specifically today, um, but you can come find me afterward uh, if you want to know more. Um, and before I talk about sort of the place uh, that WebXR has and VR and AR have, um, I want to talk a little bit about the web platform as a whole. Um, so. How many of you have heard this phrase before, the web platform? Great, OK, so that's like half. Um, yeah, so it, it, this is a pretty amorphous term. Um, the most reliable source on the internet, Wikipedia, says that the web platform is a collection of technologies developed uh, as, as open standards by the W3C and other standard bodies like uh, OpenJS, like ECMA, uh, and so on. Um, and that's one. That's sort of one way of looking at it. Uh, another way of looking at it uh, is if you go to platform.html5.org, uh, you see this giant checklist, uh, and it's rather overwhelming, um, of all the various specs that can, can that can possibly fit into a browser. Um, and this is another way of thinking about it. Um, but the thing that's important to remember about this concept of the web as a platform, the web platform, is that what all these checkboxes are meant to enable users or users or developers to create new things or have new experiences. Um, and so when we talk about introducing WebXR uh, to the web platform, uh, like the low level implementation is this thing called the WebXR device API. Um, but what we actually want to enable are things like uh, what's on the slide right here. And, if this, if this is, doesn't really make sense to you, I'll go through some more examples uh, for the rest of this talk. But in general, uh, the, the breadth of XR uh, is meant to cover everything from uh, augmented reality to virtual reality to the normal sort of 2D web that, you, that we've been programming for uh, decades now. Um, so in, at its most basic level, something you can already do today with the, uh, the Canvas API or 3JS uh, is embed a 3D scene onto a page. Um, when we talk about WebXR, we're talking about, uh, if, if, if we're talking about an AR context, then we mean something like grabbing the camera and telling you where the floor is, or telling you where, or telling you being the developer, uh, telling you, giving you back a mesh of geometry and allowing you to place here a green cube, uh, but anything into the real world. Um, when we talk about VR, uh, basically it's all of that stuff minus the camera and minus the real world. Um, and while these look like really disparate use cases, uh, under the hood they can sort of be unified, and that's what the well, that's what the WebXR API is trying to do. Um, so the WebXR API is relatively recent, um, and so there are a bunch of uh, there's, there are a bunch of tools uh, to get started with this work, uh, so I'm going to go over sort of what the state of the art has been um, traditionally, um, and the sort of the most high fidelity experience, at least for prototyping with web AR, uh, for the last couple of years has been using custom browsers. So because the WebXR device API hasn't shipped in uh, in, in most browsers, uh, and it wasn't even standardized until February of this year. Um, the easiest way to get started uh, sort of hacking around with those APIs was actually to use uh, uh, a few different custom browsers. One from Google called WebAR on AR Kit slash, or WebAR on AR Core. Uh, it doesn't really roll off the tongue. Basically, all it's doing is taking those proprietary uh, AR APIs, so AR Kit and AR Core on iOS and Android, respectively. Um, and fusing those to a, an instance of uh, a web page. So this isn't Safari, this isn't Chrome. Uh, well, this is Safari on iOS. Um, but the point is like, this isn't a shipped browser. Like this, like you would have, this link goes to a GitHub page 
and you would have to download that and manually build, build an, uh, a, uh, a custom app uh, in Xcode and then get that onto your phone in order to get this running. Um, but it's really, it's really interesting because you're able to actually use WebGL and JavaScript, uh, and it has access to things like the plane or to things like hyper-accurate uh, device orientation. Um, the other option uh, that's a little bit easier to get started with uh, is the WebXR viewer, uh, which is basically the same thing, but provided from Mozilla. Um, and they actually put this onto the App Store because they realized that getting, like, not everyone either has, a, has an iPhone but doesn't have a Mac, or it's just not everyone is comfortable building a custom uh, iOS app uh, off, randomly off of GitHub. Um, and so they provide a similar thing. Uh, and those are two sort of like custom browsers. Uh, for a long time, VR was the same way, where you would have to fork, you would have to download a custom fork of the web of, of Google Chrome or Firefox in order to run web VR um, before that was standardized. Um, but now we have uh, a bunch more options. Uh, and so the rest, of the, the, the rest of the tools in here are going to be things that can actually run in regular browsers. Um, so the first and sort of most common one in my mind is 3.js. Um, for a long time, 3.js was sort of the default way to do any 3D onto a normal 2D, um, inside of a normal 2D web page. Um, the, all these examples are actually the WebGL context running on a VR device. So you would navigate, you would be in your VR headset, you would navigate to the 3.js examples website, and you could click a button and say, enter VR. And that would, that would automatically move you into uh, one of these experiences. Um, and that's, that's sort of where we're at right now. Um, and you can do really basic things, uh, but you can do a lot with these really basic things like position and hand orientation um, and stuff like that. Um, the other option that is actually built off of 3.js uh, is this library called A-Frame. And whereas 3.js itself, uh, is a proper JavaScript library. Um, A-Frame has a completely different goal. A-Frame was designed explicitly for people who only have familiarity with HTML and CSS and, don't, and, are, and are possibly intimidated or just don't want to deal with WebGL or, three, or you know, uh, disparate three, uh, 3D contexts. Um, so in order to understand A-Frame a little bit, um, this slide shows you all of the code for the scene that's going to run in the next slide. Uh, so here you can see, in this is a normal body, uh, and then everything inside of here is A-frame code. Uh, it all looks like HTML. Um, in fact, it, it this library precedes the web component spec, uh, but it was modeled off of web components. Uh, so everything has a dash in it, uh, and it, everything starts with a dash. Um, a dash scene is the top level, and that sort of gives you your 3D environment. And then anything you put inside of here that A frame recognizes, it will actually create for you in a full 3D world. Um, and to see what that actually looks like, so this is an iframe, uh, and right now I'm dragging around with my cursor, uh, and I can actually press either with my arrow keys or my WASD keys. Uh, I can move. Uh, really naturally in here. Uh, if I was on a mobile device, uh, this button at the bottom right would allow me to enter Google Cardboard View. Um, if I was hooked up to a VR machine, it would give me the VR instance that we saw earlier. Um, and just to sort of prove out like that this is actually what's running, uh, you can even, in real time, edit the scene from the inspector. Uh, there are, like These are just normal HTML elements that are bound to the WebGL context. Um, and so that's a really easy way to get started. It handles almost all the complexity for you. Um, oh, that was in case it didn't work. Um, so the one other popular library that's been around for a very long time uh, is ARJS. Um, so the when I showed you WebAR, WebAR Kit, uh, or WebAR on AR Core and Kit. Uh, that was taking advantage of what we call markerless AR, basically true AR, right? Like you can point it at anything and it'll give you back a depth estimation. Uh, this is marker-based AR. So the, the way that this works is you basically have a computer vision system that is looking for a specific uh, marker. In this case, 
It's looking for the word hero inside of a big black uh, hollow square, right? Um, and then it uses 3JS uh, to sort of superimpose that on top of the marker. And it, it can tell that the one the marker is distorted and it will distort the 3JS scene above it. Um, and this is a really, this is a really easy way to do, uh, sort of to prototype image, image, image detection uh, interactions um, and sort of like more, more uh, product focused uh, sort of vision based uh, uh, AR experiences. Um, and this runs just in a normal browser. Um, one other tool is Model Viewer, which is itself a proper web component that Google provides. Uh, and it's relatively new. I think it came out at the end of last year, um, or at least it was open sourced at the end of last year. Um, and again, it is just HTML uh, with a script import tag. Uh, and you can see on the, on the right here, uh, this is sort of what you see if you're on a desktop view. But if you're on a phone, that either is an Android phone and provides this, this API called Scene Viewer, or if you're on an um, iPhone and it provides this thing called Quick Look. Uh, Model Viewer knows about it. It knows how to call out to it. And so similar to A-Frame, uh, but for a very specific use case, um, if you pass it a 3D model, it'll allow you to preview it in AR, which is what you see over here on the very, the very right. Um, this is just like a direct screen grab from my phone. Um, one other tool is, this is the second to last tool, uh, is TensorFlow.js. Um, so the TensorFlow, there were a few TensorFlow.js people at this conference. Um, they gave a talk earlier today. Um, and there, there's a lot of low level stuff you can do uh, with, with machine learning on the web. Um, but one thing that they provide is this higher level uh, sort of ready-made model uh, that they've trained on a bunch of different samples of bodies. Um, and what they actually provide back is not just a skeleton, but a way, you can see over here on the right, uh, a way to map out, like the purple is the head, the green, the light green is the torso. Um, you could theoretically uh, sort of build a whole mask over, um, over these people uh, in WebGL. Um, you could add 3D models onto them. You could do, you could do a bunch of interesting things uh, that all begin to sound exactly like AR, uh, sort of like, what, what five years ago would have been like very hard to do uh, industrial AR. Um, and speaking of industrial AR, uh, there is this one other tool set uh, that is sort of web adjacent. Um, so there's this iOS prototyping tool called Torch. Uh, and Torch is uh, designed to very quickly get you started with AR. Um, it's a no code tool. Um, but it actually just recently, like last month, uh, introduced an export option. Uh, and they partnered with a company called Eighthwall. Eighthwall is a web AR company. Um, so under the hood, they take all of their sort of iOS uh, prototyping code, transfer it over to Eighthwall, and then you can view it in a normal browser. This is run. You can see here this is running in uh, a version of iPad Safari. Um, and so yeah, that was a very long uh, sort of laundry list of tools. Um, and the, these slides are already up. Uh, so if, if you're curious about any of them and digging into them, uh, you can, I've, I've linked to all the relevant resources. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is sort of the future of like, what all of this work is heading towards. Um, so there's just on Tuesday, uh, a couple things happened. Um, this company that is an AR headset uh, the, one of the biggest AR headset companies, uh, Magic Leap, um, they produced a series of web tutorials and released them uh, as sort of both an open source blog post and as projects on uh, a platform called Glitch. Uh, Glitch is a really easy way to sort of like share and remix code, uh, similar to like CodePen if you've ever used that, um, but it has a little bit more, it gives you a full Node.js environment. Um, anyway, uh, seeing like big companies like Magic Leap uh, or uh, Microsoft with HoloLens uh, sort of release uh, web-based tooling uh, is really interesting. Uh, and it means that there is sort of is industry support for all of this. Um, something that is very nascent uh, is this website called immersiveweb.dev, uh, which is actually run by, um, this is maintained uh, by the W3C, a few folks on the W3C immersive web group. Um, and this sort of gives you a nice starting place for uh, figuring out 
what are all the requirements? Uh, how do you do VR and AR on phones? How do you do VR and AR on desktops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and it also, at the very bottom of this page, uh, provides you with examples with uh, Babylon, A-Frame, 3JS, uh, a bunch of the tools that I mentioned today. And the final thing, the final really exciting thing that happened uh, on Tuesday was that Chrome was the first, uh, first browser to ship the WebXR API uh, not, not behind a feature flag. Um, so you don't have to turn anything on. As of Chrome 79, I'm pretty sure. Um, it just works. Uh, and there, this means that because a lot of VR browsers are actually built on top of Chromium, uh, this means that a lot of VR browsers, when, they, when the next time that they update, are going to get a lot of the features, um, are, get, are going to get these features for free. Um, and this sort of, this is just the first step, right? Like next, we need every browser to implement it, but everyone is on board. Uh, the standard has been like actually drafted. Um, and so this work is like, I'm not going to say nearing completion. It's, it's a very big milestone. Um, and then the last thing is, I know I threw a lot of like random resources at your face. Uh, and there's a lot of overhead here. Um, but there, because there is so much work uh, to be done uh, and so much work actively being done, uh, the last thing I want to say about the future of XR is that it probably starts with all of you. Um, there, it's a small space right now, um, but there, that means that there is a lot of, there is, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for uh, open source contributors, uh, for people to do work. Uh, uh, getting JavaScript ready for uh, for this immersive future uh, with all the tools that I talked about. Um, yeah. And this QR code uh, goes to the link for these slides. The, yeah, sorry, these slides. Um, so yeah, that's all I have.